uh, thanks again, Dave, for the for the invite, uh, joining you again from, from California. Hopefully something a little bit fun to, to finish up on. Um, I've been fiddling around with connecting a disk drive to the BBC Micro user port. This is called Project Oil Dotter, which is a hack tip to uh, the excellent Grease Weasel project. Uh, quick intro. Um, I grew up with an Acorn Electron, um, upgraded to a BBC Master Compact at, at some stage. This picture here is, is me with my trusty BBC Master Compact back in the day, um, working on some, some game concept that, that had zero chance of, of being seen through to completion, because um, I wasn't very good at that when I was young. Um, I've had a career in, in computer security, perhaps kicked off by uh, looking at copy protection back in, back in the day. Naughty, naughty, I know. Um, and now I fiddle with retro stuff, uh, because it's fun. What more do you need uh, than to do something because it's fun, but, but also I like the intellectual challenge. Um, one, of the, one of the themes I like with some of the bit shifters work is trying to push the boundaries of what was achieved back in the day uh, and uh, create things that are um, you know, even better than what, what people worked out back in, back in the day. That's a lot of fun to me. Um, but also uh, because the machines are tractable. I was having a conversation just the other day with um, someone who wrote educational software for the BBC back in the day. And they made a comment that really resonated with me, which was that um, back then we knew what every bit did, every single bit of the machine, we, we knew what effect it would have. And uh, currently he's you know, wrestling with five megabyte JavaScript libraries and it's just, just not entirely clear what, what's going on. And it's just more, more fun perhaps if you can uh, really understand the machine in detail. That resonated with me. Maybe it'll resonate with some of you who are going back to creating things for the, the BBC. The electron. So uh, the, the biggest question to answer is, you know, why? Why would you want to connect um, a, a disk drive to the user port? Um, the sort of flippant answer here is that I never actually got to use the user port back in the day. Uh, perhaps it was because I had an electron, <laughs> which I don't think had a user port. But you know, this user port just sort of screams to, to be used, and I, ne I never got to do anything with it. So it, it's fun to go back and do that now. Uh, but more seriously, if we get the floppy disk drive controller chip out of the way by connecting the disk drive directly to the user port, maybe we can get some more control of the drive. That would be interesting. And that's a means to an end, really. And the, the end here that we're trying to achieve that could be a lot of fun is, is can we write disks that you just can't write with the vanilla BBC Micro at all? Can, can, we, can we do that? Um, particularly, there are some games that back in the day, uh, I. I don't think you can copy them um, with a BBC. The, the, the best disk copying programs um, would later on in the BBC's years fail to copy most things. Uh, you know, the, the disk copy programs, they stopped updating them, but the games, the, the sophistication of the game protection moved on. Would it be possible to create a new BBC micro copy protection that just wasn't seen back in the day that's more sophisticated, more interesting? Um, and now, if we're going, going all in, could we um, replicate in some way one of those fancy, expensive disk mastering machines? Let's see how far we can get. So here's my wonderful cable. Um, it was important to me to do this with old technology. Um, I also know very little electronics, so I've, I've used just wires. These are just jumper wires. On the right, you've got the user port connected to the BBC Micro. Um, some jumper wires on the left. You've got the, the disk drive connector and that goes to the disk drive. And uh, in case anyone wanted to replicate it, this is how it's wired. Um, if you take one thing away from this slide, it's that uh, disk drives are simpler than you think. They're pretty simple devices really, and they're not that complicated to, to drive the disk drive. Um, the way I've wired it up here is that uh, we've got um, six, pins outputting logic signals to the drive. So things like selecting the drive, turning the motor on, telling it to write, stepping. And uh, to competently control the drive, you need a couple of input signals. Um, you need to know when you're on track zero, so you can stop stepping before you clang the drive's um, stepper assembly against the metal stopper and put it out of alignment if you're unlucky. And you need an index sensor, like where are you on the track. Um, one pin that's tricky, the, the actual data pin, we'll cover that later because that's tricky. Uh, so just some, some demo, a uh, very quick initial demo. 
that shows that we can um, control some of these simpler drive signals very easily with the user port. So let's try clicking here. Um, this is a something I recorded a, like an hour or two ago. Um, I don't want to risk doing it live, not because it's not going to work, it, it's going to work, but because um, my little retro corner is, is very, very far away from my Wi-Fi and I'm already calling in from California and I just don't want to, uh, <laughs> just don't want to take that risk. So let's see if I can click that and launch it just once. Okay, let's have a very quick and simple demo of a disk drive wired to the user port. So on the screen here, we see a couple of uh, commands. The first command uh, just sort of sets the logic level on the user port to all high. The second line is just setting the user port to being an output. And then this um, third line that we're going to about to run is going to set a couple of the high logic levels to low. And we'll see what effect sending sending those low logic levels has on the disk drive. Which is over here underneath my shirts is the disk drive that's wired up to the user port. And we saw the disk drive light come on, the motor spun up, and the, there's a click, the head loaded. There's one more thing we can do, which is if we uh, set a few more logic lines to low, like all of them, why not? And see what happens. Oh, we heard a click from the disk drive. That was the uh, that was the head stepping. Oh, there's a nice noise on the screen too. Okay, that's just demonstrating that the setup um, in the broad sense is, is tractable. So let's jump to the hard part, which I mentioned earlier, the, the right data pin. Um, and the reason this is hard is because the right data pin is, is the only pin that you're, you need to program with precise timing and a fairly significant amount of bandwidth if you want to write a, a real disk. All the other pins, you just sort of um, bring them high or low to turn the motor on or off whenever you, you feel like it. So uh, here's a little, the little diagram here is from one of the manuals actually from one of my disk drives that I found uh, online and it just sort of shows you the expectation of, of the disk drive. Um, you know, it, it expects um, the, the sort of pulse you send it to go low for a certain amount of time with a certain tolerance. And uh, we're going to be writing a, a standard BBC micro disk which used single density back in the day. That's aka FM, aka DFM encoding. Uh, fortunately, that's a very simple encoding. Um, just every four microseconds, you either send a pulse to the disk drive or you don't. And that will result in an FM in encoded disk um, within some, some constraints for well formatted FM. Uh, so four microseconds, that's eight CPU cycles at two megahertz. Uh, that's, that's, that's not much. That is not enough for a CPU loop where, where we're doing something like in, in the CPU, the 6502, we're doing something like, oh, maybe load a byte from memory, maybe shift it along to get the next bit, write the bit to the user port. Not gonna happen. Uh, just, just, not, just, just not enough uh, horsepower there on, on the CPU. However, the VIA chip that the user port is connected to is itself a one megahertz device. We may be able to use some widgets of that chip to, uh, to, to get us going, writing this high frequency signal to the, to the right data pin. So attempt one, um, big fail actually, but that's what makes this, this story fun, uh, tripping a few times on the way. Uh, but the, the thing you would naturally reach for to solve this problem is the VIA shift register. It's, it's designed for exactly what we need. You give the VIA chip a byte, and in its own time, it'll put those, the bits of, those, of that byte out onto the pins. So then you have the CPU back to be getting on with other stuff, such as working out what the next byte is. And together, there's just about enough time um, to have, have these two things working in tandem to, um, to write a disk with enough power on the BBC, enough, enough horsepower bandwidth on the BBC. Uh, however, problems. Uh, the, there's one mode of this VIA running at one megahertz that is fast enough to attempt this. And this is um, this little quote at the top is, uh, if you set a few bits to one and one and zero, uh, you get the shift register to shift out under control of the system clock. Um, the system clock being one megahertz. Um, that means every tick it'll go high and then but low, uh, and it can output a 500 kilohertz frequency clock and a 250 kilohertz data signal, which is just what you need. So it's just capable, just about capable of putting out a signal of sufficient bandwidth. However, if you look at this oscilloscope trace, this is a trace of the um, VIA 
clock pin output for sh uh, whilst you're shifting. I, I just could not get this thing to, to start shifting and keep shifting smoothly as you feed it more bytes. It seems like fundamentally the VIA chip just um, needs a few of its own internal cycles to get going again uh, when you feed it a new byte after the old byte has, has ended. And you know, I tried feeding it the new byte a little bit early to see if that would help. And I, I just, maybe it's possible. I just couldn't, I just couldn't get that to, to work. Um, I think when you use this, the VIA shift register, you're normally not operating right at the frequency limits of the chip. You're normally maybe um, using one of the other modes. Um, and some of the other modes sound like they might be able to handle this, but again, they're just not, not fast enough. So um, summary, I couldn't get it to work. Maybe it's possible. Um, but I just I couldn't I couldn't work it out. If you work it out, I'll buy you a beer. I'd be very very pleased to hear that this can be done. Anyway, brings us on to attempt two, which was a partial success. So again, if you with a sort of detailed reading of the VIA data sheet, um, there's this interesting mode that I've not really seen used and not really seen not you don't hear much about it. If you again set this magic um, sequence one zero one into one of its registers you get this pulse mode, which is quite interesting. The, the reason it's interesting to us is you, when you're in pulse mode, you interact with the VIA chip once, and it'll do two things in response to that. It'll lower uh, a logic level for a microsecond and, and then raise it again. And uh, that, that's, that's kind of uh, useful. Maybe that's enough to be tractable. And I did get it working. The trouble is, again, the CPU just doesn't have enough time to, to do a loop of getting bits together. So you just have to have this linear block of code that is is, um, is writing to the to the to the chip, and that makes it extremely memory sense uh, memory intensive. Uh, the best I could work out was two bytes of six five zero two code per one bit of disk data, uh, where one bit of disk data is um, includes having to send clock bits as well as data bits. So when you sort of calculate it out, that sort of mushrooms up to about a hundred kilobytes of linear six five zero two code required. Uh, but to write a full track, um, which you could do on a master, maybe with judicious sideways RAM bank swapping. But I like doing this this stuff on a vanilla BBC. It just feels more satisfying to do it with more constraints. So you can write um, enough um, to write a small sector in one go with a with a vanilla BBC. But that's not very satisfying because some um, disks to write them properly, you you can't do it unless you um, write a large sector, a, a, like a one kilobyte sector, or even some disks that the sectors are packed so tightly you just need to write a track at a time. So uh, I moved on from this, even though I did get some interesting disk services written and some interesting protections written, I moved on to attempt three. Um, Tom Seddon's genius idea, you may know Tom, he's the author of the B2 emulator, um, also um, co-author of some of the bit shifters demos. Um, before we go into his idea, what he, what he said to try um, whilst we were debating pins and connections, uh, let's just demo the, the final oil daughter um, doing, it, doing its thing. Let's click that, maximize that. Okay, let's demo oil daughter. So in the disk drive zero right now, we have a totally blank disk as evidenced by the disk fault 18. Let's take it out. Drive zero and put it into uh, drive nothing, I guess. This drive is not connected to a floppy controller port. It's connected through the user port. Let's run the oil daughter program. And that noise you hear is the disk drive controlled through the user port seeking to track zero, and it says OK track zero, meaning that the uh, signal, the track zero signal has been indicated through the user port and we've seen that. In theory, if we type the right disk command, the magic will kick off. Let's see. So there's a pattern used to write to disk and we're off. So every track you see this sort of interesting noise pattern on the screen. That's, the, that's it doing its high frequency write thing to the disk drive. We can have a look at the oscilloscope view. Uh, every time you see the, every time you see the sort of uh, high density peaks popping in, that's the signal going to the disk drive's right head. 
it's going click 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 once per track this is a 40 track disc it's writing so in theory you could count 40 clicks before we're done let's have a look at that nice pattern on the screen again I think we're approaching 40 clicks now there it should be done any second there it is it has written a disc will it work what we'll do is we'll take the freshly written disc out of drive nothing in particular put it into drive one and we'll hit the old shift break Oh, looking good so far. Firetrack now loading. Now the reason Firetrack was picked as a demo to back up is that this is one game released slightly later in the BBC's lifetime that none of the uh, disk backup tools back in the day were able to copy because it has quite an interesting on disk protection format and uh, we've got this far might as well yeah, start again works fine okay um what did we just see what was tom's tom seddon's uh, mystery genius idea um so uh, it's a video to disk cable um a type of cable i you don't see sold on amazon very often um but yeah we we wired up um one of the video output pins to to the disk right Pin. And that was, um, I've quoted Tom from, um, from a bit shifter's discussion here directly. He's like, well, why not um, set up the 6845 appropriately, fill the memory with suitable values, and wire it up to one of the RGB output pins. Uh, at the time, um, I think my response was, ah, that's nice. Um, but then thinking about it, you know, maybe it's, it's, you start to think maybe it's possible. Um, and it did turn out to be possible. So we use the R pin, the red pin at the RGB port uh, specifically, but the, the G and the B pin would have been fine because we were writing white or black. Um, that pin in mode zero provides up to 16 megahertz of resolution, which is um, a pretty good figure for, for a BBC era computer. Uh, I, I use mode four uh, to lower the memory requirements of the system. That gives us an eight megahertz pixel clock. Uh, the way it works is when the, when the drive right gate is opened. Um, we, we open the right gate actually um, in tandem with seeing the index signal so we can write uh, the track starting where it should start. Uh, we, we have the 6845 video chip in an unusual state. Uh, it's writing each frame, not like a V-Sync frame, but each CRTC frame um, is one scan line long, 32 characters long, that's 32 bytes in, in mode, mode four. Um, while a frame, 32 byte frame is displaying, the address of the next frame is programmed so that every 32 bytes, 32 microseconds, you can select a, a, a bunch of uh, bits to output on the video R pin, essentially. Uh, we pre-calculate pre -calculate a little table so that we can um, pick a, a common combination of bits. Uh, there are actually um, we actually output um, four data bits per 32 microsecond block, and there's only 16 combinations of those. Uh, so why does it work? Um, well, memory-wise, there are only 16 combinations, so the lookup table ends up um, coming out to only 500, 512 bytes. This is, these are figures that are much more amenable to BBC-sized problems. Um, and the data dri driving into that lookup table, it, um, if you calculate it out, ends up being 12 kilobytes per full track. So again, tractable on a 32 kilobyte uh, original BBC. Uh, well, you know, we're getting lucky that these, we're, we're just sort of being able to line up with the BBC constraints uh, here. So sort of lucky in a way, but uh, quite quite gratifying that it, it, we can get it working. And CPU wise, there's enough CPU overhead. Every, um, we get 64 cycles to select the next bunch of bits to we want to send down the video port. And, uh, it all it all balances out, and you saw it working in that in that demo. Headaches. So uh, seeing it working uh, sort of hides the fact that there are a ton of headaches to to get this working. Uh, the first of which, um, the first couple of which were electrical problems. Um, 
So if you look at the oscilloscope picture on the left, this is what I had initially going out from the video R pin uh, and as the voltage levels as seen at the drive. And if you look at those voltage levels, they are the, go from about 1.5 volts on the low end to maybe 3. Point, what is that? 3.4 volts, 3.3 volts on the high end. That simply won't do. Um, we're trying to pull the, the signal low to get the drive to sort of reverse its magnetic polarity on its head. And uh, if we only pull low to 1.5 volts, that's not good enough. Uh, TTL requires you to pull it 8.0.8 volts or lower, you know, preferably <laughs> much closer to zero would be better. And uh, the, the, whatever circuitry is on the video, um, video R pin is not, not able to do it. Um, fortunately, uh, this was resolved by removing the bus termination resistor array from the drive. Uh, the, the termination resistor array, best I know, kind of directly connects the positive voltage line to the to the some of the um, some of the bus lines, and that, that's probably why pulling it to zero volts is is, is tricky. You remove this, and the voltages are uh, perfect. Uh, so that's good. Um, but beware, you know, this thing's there for a reason. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't ship with it. Uh, so without that resistor, you've got to be aware your cable length, if it gets too long, then high frequency signals will degrade. Uh, also floating voltages. Um, the side select pin wasn't wired up initially, uh, and that would float at around one point something volts with nothing driving it. Again, that's a problem. Is the drive going to write to the upper head or the lower head? It, it can probably choose either. Maybe since we're out of spec, it can choose to catch fire. I don't know. But uh, certainly you can not write correctly. So I, you just have to. I just had to wire the side select pin into one of the user port pins and, and pick a and pick a definite value for it. Electrical properties fixed. Um, the six eight four five last column quirk, the, the bane of, of every bit shifters uh, demo writer. Um, if you look at this picture on the left, the sort of vertical black striped columns are. Um, this last column quirk, whereby the very for every output, uh, not necessarily CRT output line, but every sort of chip output line, the very last character is, goes out blank, regardless of whether you um, provide it an actual memory data byte or not. That isn't blank; it goes out blank, and that's a problem for us um, because that means that the our video signal going to the drive is always going to go below at a certain point and going low at a certain point would imply um, uh, writing a pulse to disk at a certain point uh, when we don't necessarily want to do that. Uh, this was resolved. I resolved it by just inverting the waveform uh, and the descent to the drive. Uh, that technically now we're sending it a waveform that violates the, the specification we saw on one of the earlier drives. But I tested it on a few different drives from different manufacturers. Fortunately, none of them seem to care. You know, the only thing I seem to care about, and this is kind of predictable because it's the simplest thing you could do, I only seem to care about the transition of the signal going from high to low, so the negative edge. Uh, that's what makes them reverse the polarity on the, on the disk head. So that resolved without too much of a fight. Oh my goodness. Headache for DRAM decay. The last headache, but once you get bitten by this one, it's, it's a big headache. So um. Just to demonstrate DRAM decay, I wrote a program that decays itself. As you can see on the screen here, it's a basic program where it says, that it used to say the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog and now it's been bit flipped. So it doesn't quite say that. Other things about the program have been corrupted. A, a TAN keyword has appeared in the middle of, of my call statement at line 90. Line 30 has become line 8,000 and something. Uh, what a mess. Um, so what's going on here is that, um, DRAM refresh is done as a side effect uh, of the 6845 video chip. So um, the side effect is just that the, a normal BBC screen mode happens to uh, visit a lot of different uh, RAM addresses as it can go through you know, maybe up to 20K of RAM, maybe even more. Uh, and that side effect of that is that every, um, every part of the DRAM is refreshed within a, within a, within a certain time period that is within the, the, the DRAM specification. And uh, 
if you don't do that, if you put the video chip in a funny state like we're like we're doing, then uh, your DRAM will just start to decay, and uh, if you're not expecting it, your program's going to start to behave really weird, and it's going to be a headache to <laughs> to debug that. Um, just a little historical uh, diversion. I noticed that some of the early Acon soft disks do this to you when you cat them. So um, when you cat something on the BBC, you can actually output a, a VDU command that does does this and uh, starts starts messing up your RAM. And that's nasty because that messes up the system RAM too. And then maybe the disk systems won't work at all until you power the machine off and on. So maybe that's why they stopped doing it. Anyway, once you know this exists, this horror, you can you can get around it. Just that whenever you're doing um, Whenever you're doing a loop whilst the video chip's in a funny state, just work into that loop something that just iterates across uh, a bunch of RAM addresses and you'll be fine. Uh, if you don't, you will not be fine and you may even regret it. I, I lost a few hours of work one time by bit flipping an actual basic program I was working on and that was, that was not fun to try and unpick. Um, I think it also bit flipped the system disk area and corrupted my disk image as well. That, that sucked. So. Um, be careful, or just develop in an emulator, which I've been, which I've been doing since. I don't think any of the emulators yet emulate DRAM decay. Um, maybe you could add a, an emulator feature that if someone um, goes into DRAM decay mode, maybe just sort of delete a few files on the host, maybe to simulate the, the emotional experience of losing data. Uh, no, don't don't do that. That would that would be a bad idea. Um, so that's all the headaches dealt with. Um, what can we do? With, with this capability that we have to write, write disks through the user port and the video port. So best I know, it's possible to back up uh, any BBC protected disk. I, I, I can't imagine a disk surface, that, especially the BBC, a BBC disk surface that tended to use simpler protection. I can't imagine something that you couldn't, couldn't write. After all, you have control of, very precise control of when to send a pulse to the disk drive, and and um, that that's all that's that's all you need to write write disk surfaces. Um, there is a pretty tough uh, BBC protection by some Western security company that I came across. I want I'll probably do a separate blog post about that. That's probably the toughest thing to write. You would have to actually synchronize the drive speed that you're writing to with the write speed of the of the stuff you're sending through the video chip. Um, but but fundamentally doable. Just needs a bit of uh, just need a bit of extra work. Yeah, you can replicate any disk surface with flux reversal with resolution 125 nanoseconds. Again, that's a pretty mind-blowingly good figure for BBC era tech. Um, you use mode naught, you get 62 nanosecond resolution. I don't know of anything that needs that yet. If you really wanted to, you could write other standard disk encodings other than the BBC's FM disk encoding. You could write MFM, aka double density. You could write um, GCR encoding that was used by Apple II, Commodore 64. Again, there's nothing special about those. It's just sending a pulse at the right time with certain, um, uh, what's the word, certain, um, uh, not constraints, uh, certain protocol for the timing between pulses. Nothing, nothing special about them in particular. Uh, we could do, we could write Dungeon Master fuzzy bit disks on a budget. Uh, don't know if we have time to demo it, but there's a fuzz command in the old auto tool that will just make a track of these things called fuzzy bits. Here's a quote from the one of the authors of Dungeon Master back in the day. Um, got a little bit overexcited about a patent they had on this um, because there's tons of people, prior art people doing similar things uh, earlier. So a little bit arrogant perhaps to have, have patented it, but uh, um, you know, to this is 1987 that this game released on the Atari ST. They they needed a forty thousand dollar specialized disc device to, to write the discs, um, and it was impossible to create a disc without that hardware. Uh, well, uh, now you know you could have done it with a four hundred pound BBC Micro uh, and, a, and a few wires and a cable. Um, it's fun getting that, that to work. You can write another type of protection called weak bits with very high precision. And um, 
one of the disc protections I think is, is, is the most interesting. It's called long track disc protection. Uh, you can write that. And uh, this is the last, um, this is the last uh, slide, I think. So I think we do have time to uh, very quickly demo a, a video of that. Ah, but that is annoying. We have lost the, uh, have we, have we lost the, uh, no, it's just not visible. Click that. And we can watch the video. Okay, let's demo Oil Dotter writing the fairly advanced long track protection. In theory, we just type long and it'll write a single demo track to the disk. Done. You heard a click, click. That was the dry fed loading and unloading. Let's get our disk. Put it in a disk drive actually connected through the disk drive port. Um, just need to load an analysis program to like start playing around with and looking at that long track we just wrote. That should do the trick. Okay, so the, this is another program I've written, it's called Disk Beast, it lets you analyze what's on the disk, so we should be able to type init zero. There we go, it's initialized operation for drive zero. So long track protection is where you write bits to the disk slightly faster than a normal disk drive would ever write them. And then when you read them back, uh, you should be able to tell the the timing difference and use that check, the check of the timing of reading bits back to do copy protection. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to read a couple of sectors from the same track we just wrote and see if there are any interesting timing differences there. So that's sector zero. Oops. Sector one. Okay, sector zero, it says time 229. Sector one, it says time 258. Uh, time being in uh, 64 microsecond chunks or normal disk byte sized chunks. And that's a very significant difference, um, well over 10%. And you can sort of check the difference between those two as your copy protection and require a, a significant difference between those two timings. And if, if there's a significant difference there, the copy protection passes. If not, the copy protection fails. This is a very powerful and fundamental copy protection method used, I think, in the Amiga days quite a bit because it really is difficult without specialized hardware to, uh, to write bytes to the disk faster than you should be able to. I mean, the disk controller has one job really, which is to write bytes at exactly the right speed. So um, that demonstrates that uh, Oil Dotter was able to write a successful long track copy protection. We have the demo. Oh, there's the demo. Uh, just to, to finish up, what can't we do with this? Um, there's no support for reading disks yet, uh, which hasn't been a focus of mine because uh, BBC disks, you can generally read them through the controller. Otherwise, what would be the point in selling a disk that the, the BBC couldn't read? Uh, you know, copy protection itself depends on an asymmetry between yes, you can read it, no, you can't write it. Uh, it's unclear also whether any of the VIA chip input modes uh, like pulse counting or, sh or the actual shift register itself could handle um, the short pulses sent from disk drives, typically less than a microsecond, uh, without extra, without a bit of extra circuitry, maybe to turn the pulse into a flip flop or something uh, uninvestigated. Uh, I would expect headaches, to be honest, because the, I had headaches with the VIA chip in this in this area on the right side of things. Uh, it's also more of a fun project than a serious replacement for, for Grease Weasel. If some of the capabilities that you've seen in terms of read, uh, writing certain disk services are appealing, uh, you may be better served buying a Grease Weasel and using modern technology to do this. Um, so yeah, on to, on to Q&A, and there's some, uh, I'll share these slides, there's some links here on other other interesting disc related things that you may want to go and um, uh, go and check out if, if, if this is of interest to you. So. Switch back. I will go
go to the chat in case there's any questions in, in the chat. Uh, there's one um, one question. What software do I drive this with? Um, the software you saw making these disk surfaces is called Oiled Otter. Uh, that's, that's the project name. Uh, one of the links on the Q&A slide at the end is a link to the Oiled Otter GitHub repository. It's, it's all, all open. Um, there's also Disk Beast in the same place, which is uh, a prototype tool for uh, reading and analyzing disk surfaces. Um, I'll be talking some more about disk beast on the forums in the near future. Um, I've got an idea how to maybe use that to assist with preservation. Um, yeah, happy to take any more questions um, on the chat or you can um, speak up if you want. I haven't heard anyone speak for a while, so I'm not sure if my audio has failed or something. I think we're all stunned. Oh, hi, Tricky. <laughs> audio is working fine. Dear. I, I think that's probably um, one of the most unusual things I've ever seen, the idea of connecting a disk drive to the video output port of a computer. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> I have to say, um, uh, oh, my mind's gone completely blank. Um, who, who was it who gave you that suggestion? I'm sorry, I, my mind. Tom, Tom Seddon. Tom Seddon. Yes, t t I have to say, uh, that is the most extraordinary bit of lateral thinking I, I, I think I've ever uh, come across because um, I, I can sort of, I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm quite fascinated at how you came up with the idea of connecting um, a disk drive to the user port anyway. Uh, but then to make the jump from the user port to the RGB port um, is, is just so bizarre. Uh, but but, but uh, uh, obviously a very, um, uh, um, very satisfactory conclusion and very interesting. Um, I'll, I'll very briefly, if it's okay, tell you how I came up with the original user port idea. Um, indeed, yes. Uh, living here in the US, um, road tripping is a big thing and we love nature, so we do a lot of road trips. Um, but it's a big country, it takes a long time to get to some of the more interesting places. Uh, but I have this strength in the evening that I can use to do overnight drives whilst the kids sleep in the back seats, uh, which works very well for having non-whining kids. Um, so, uh, and then the next day I'm a mess because I, I sleep during the day to sort of catch up on sleep. And if someone wakes me during this, this phase where I'm sort of catching up on sleep, I'm a bit delirious. <laughs> And someone woke me up. We're, we're, we're in Utah at this stage. I think we're uh, going to go skiing in Utah and beautiful, beautiful state for mountains and, um, and just rock formations and, and, and just beautiful. So uh, I was prodded into wakefulness and I was delirious. And then I thought I must have woken up and said, oh, what about if I connect a disk drive to the user port? It, it really was, uh, not, it really did happen like that. I sort of uh, must have been deliriously dreaming about creative things I could do with the BBC. and. Uh, was woken at just the right time. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Actually, the user port could be used for a few other things too. Uh, when I was in Iceland, I actually connected a pet printer to the user port. Somebody wrote something up in a magazine. I just basically took it out of the magazine because I had no real electronic experience. Work first, first goal is excellent. It's great for listings and stuff when I was trying to learn. I think the, the interesting thing is that if somebody had happened upon this idea uh, back in the day, in the 80s, it, it would have been um, a, a nightmare for people trying to copy protect their discs. Uh, and one could have seen a whole industry um, selling um, RGB to floppy cables and associated software uh, for, for cracking discs. Possibly, yeah. I mean, if, if the disc protection had been really strong back in the day, um, people would have just lent even heavy, more heavily on, on just cracking the games that were, uh, you know, cracking being the word I used for 
um, you know, disassembling, removing copy protection checks. You know, it would have forced people even more down that route. Not to say that people didn't achieve that anyway without every game. Like I think tape, tape to disc cracks were were the thing that the, the people did back in the day. Um, yeah, yeah. We would, have made, made, we would have forced them to do it. <laughs> For everything if we had uh, extremely strong disc protection. Uh, there wasn't um, a, a huge industry, certainly at the beginning, was I mean, most games w were sold on tape. Um, discs were very much a secondary market for games. Um, so uh, the, the main protection was in terms of di uh, tape-based games. Sorry, I seem to be hogging the, 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 uh, the chat. There must be other people who have got questions to ask. I'm just checking the... Um... Hey, Chris, can you hear me? Oh, yes, it's my uh... microphone. Yay, my microphone's working at last, hooray. Um, so what's next? I guess is the obvious question. What's, uh, what's next for the Oil Otter? Yeah. Well, I think Oil Otter is, is is kind of done. You know, it can. Um, I really don't see a disc surface it couldn't write because um, it can do the fundamental thing, which is pulse a line with arbitrary timing and good resolution. Um, I do want to go to the read side of things, uh, Disc Beast, and um, help try and help with um, some of the preservation efforts by shipping a tool out that people can use to um, work out if they have a variant of a disc we've never seen before. And if so, maybe capture a copy of it without a grease weasel. Um, I mean, a, a grease weasel will always capture you the best view of a disc surface, but you can do kind of okay if you've got a BBC with a 1770 disc controller. So I'll be um, you know, send, sending out some requests for, for early testers onto the Stardot forums uh, in the near future, I expect. Cool, thanks. Awesome presentation, by the way, absolutely fantastic. Thank you. I guess even if you can't get a perfect copy, you know whether you need a perfect copy of yours because there isn't one. Well, not perfect, but you know what I mean. Yeah, love to. I know you were talking about uh, the, the possibility that you could use uh, or that you could create copy protection with this system too. So maybe back in the day, if this was available, would it have been possible to create copy protection that this device wouldn't read or would it always be readable and copyable? That's, that's the next level right there. Um, could you make something with this that is hard to copy? Um, I think maybe the, the way I would go about it um, would be to uh, do a very small thin slice of one of those copy protection methods I, I described, such that when you read the disc, you're not really sure what to write. That's the that's the asymmetry. You need an asymmetry somewhere, and the one the one I would look for is um, leaving doubt on the read as to what um, what what you're supposed to have read. But the answer is maybe it's possible. Um, but once you know for sure what's on the disk surface, there's nothing stopping you from writing it that I can see, nothing at all. So you'd have to try and kind of hide a little bit of what you've really put on the disk surface. But so the read part of the program isn't really sure what to write. Well, I think you've given true hackers a little bit of hope there. <laughs> so are you thinking um, for people to, to check if they've got unique copies of disks? Uh, but then need to be um, sampled. Did you say that uh, a little bit of that you'd ship out a little bit of hardware for them to check with? Oh no, I'm um, just uh, a little program. Uh, I want to do. I want to try and uh, ship a software-only program that will uh, uh, fingerprint essentially a disk and also capture it to a certain fidelity um, uh, where, where possible. Um, I have it kind of working. Uh, well, I have it working very well on my machine. It can capture, it can capture disks with sufficient fidelity to write them. Everyone I've tried. So that um, that fire track writing demo you saw, even though it's got a pretty tricky protection, was captured with a raw software tool, no hardware widget, um, with a one seven seventy disk controller, which 
is reasonably capable of reading, not so much of writing. Um, so yeah, my, my, my dream is to ship out a software any program, people run it on a disk, um, say Repton 3, we had a thread about Repton 3 variants on the forums the other day, and maybe we put out a call, can everyone with a Repton 3 disk run this tool on their disk, and it spits out a CLC 32, and then we can find the variant which has got the fix for the fungus bug or whatever it was. Um, so that's the sort of thing I'm trying to do. And then if someone's got it, you know, um, okay, press the other button and it will write these these files that I can stitch back into an HFE so that we can all um, share the original protected disk. Uh, that's that's close to needing more testers. Um, I have it working on my machine. It kind of works on Tom Seddon's master. It prints the wrong result up to the screen in basic, but writes the correct file. So uh, <laughs> we need to debug that, but then we'll testers for, for more broad testing. There's a couple of uh, questions in chat uh, from Bill Carr, who is lurking. He's asked, what protection on Firetrack is so exotic? He doesn't remember it being too tricky. That's a good question. I, I was afraid someone would answer this because I didn't get a chance to fully, fully look into it. Um, but um, I think it uses track, it uses the protection where it hides some bytes in between sectors, which was a fairly common thing back in the day, actually. It was the protection that most, that, that everyone kind of settled on if they wanted a, a, a more advanced protection towards the later stages of the, the BBC's lifetime, best I know. Um, Bill Carr can probably correct me if I'm misstating that because he's also done some great work here. Um, so I think Firetrack hid some bytes between sectors, but hid it between the penultimate and ultimate sector whereas everyone else seemed to be putting it after the final sector. And maybe that was enough to confuse the disk copy programs. Um, I don't know, but, um, but yeah, Vector 2 crashes horribly. Disk Duplicator 3 takes a swing at writing a disk, but then the disk won't load. Um, even Disk Beast, my program, something about the track makes me print out an, a huge red, red blob with an exclamation mark. Um, but then it continues on and, and, and has captured it correctly. So uh, yeah, I, I might have to um, commit to doing an analysis at it on it when I get the, when I get my hands on a real fire track disk and uh, send a few notes to the to the forum. And the second question in chat was uh, Ian Smallshire. Could you he said he missed fifteen minutes in the middle, but um, could you write during? during a track change to add information outside normal tracks? That's a very, uh, that's a very interesting question. I was, I was wondering this last night. Um, like what happens if you don't turn the motor on, but you sort of write while stepping the head outwards? Could you, could you, know, could you like write lines of data radiating outwards from the center of the disk or something absolutely insane like that? Um, or what happens indeed if you're in the middle of a write and you step the track? Um, the answer is it's going to depend on the drive. So um, I didn't realize this until I started this research, but a lot of drives, there is actually a lot of behavior that the drive is free to implement differently depending on how it, how it wishes. Um, so if the drive sees something it considers crazy, like a step request in the middle whilst the motor's, uh, well, it's okay to step when the motor's not on, but maybe, um, maybe the write gate is on and you send a step request. Uh, maybe the more um, modern drives would, would do well to ignore that. Uh, but you'll be able to find some older drive that just does whatever you tell it without really sanitizing what you've sent it. So you, you, there's certainly something to try here. Uh, some drives would, would, would do something weird. I just, don't, I just haven't tried it, and I, I would also be curious as to what the effects are that you could get. That was very quiet. I didn't quite hear. Oh, you've just typed it in. Um, yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Cool. Um, yeah, this kind of reminds me of a device I used to have for the IBM PC called Backer. And basically it was um, an ISA card that went in and it plugged into the um, into a V8, 
VHS VCR and you used it for backing up your, your hard drive it um, I, it didn't use the VGA port to do it but um, it was a similar thing sort of encoding it as a as a video encoding data as a video signal I suppose um, yeah I don't know if, uh, how common these these backing up devices were interesting yeah put that way I guess you could um you could view teletext as you know using a video signal for data, couldn't you? I guess this, I guess this has cropped up, uh, cropped up multiple times in the in the past, which is uh, not surprising. Yeah, I think LGR did uh, a video um, about um, VCR backups about eight or nine months ago. Um, so um, it certainly fits with his. Um, uh, um, weird um obsession with sort of weird peripherals who is that uh, lgr it's a uh he's um retro computing channel mostly focused on uh, early pcs um and he has a um a series that he calls oddware that's what it is oddware um and he, and he sort of highlights software and hardware which is sort of obsolete or bizarre and I think he did uh, a video about a VHS um, backup system. Links in the chat. Funny enough, I was watching the 8-bit guy, one of the 8-bit guy's uh, YouTube videos, and he he um, he did a a thing where he he pulsed. Um, there was a direction pin and a step pin for the uh, things, and it's a uh, he, he was. It sounded like he was saying it will work on any any drive. It's just relating to what you were saying before about sending a step while you were sending uh, data to be written to the tr to the track. So maybe maybe they they did work. Um, that you know the uh, the step was virtually hardwired and didn't it wouldn't interfere with right um, right actions and right commands. That um, you remind me of the Floppotron. If no one has seen the Floppotron, um, that's something they should look at. That's where uh, like 20 or something, I don't know, drives um, are stepped in unison, but at different frequencies to make to make music. Um, e excellent work. Um, I was going to, I didn't have time, I was going to add a command to Oil Dotter called Brand, where it would play the first few famous notes of the Brandenburg Concerto, just illustrating that you do have you know, perfect control of the drive signals. Um, but you know, time, time constraints, and so on. Yeah, it does seem to indicate that it works with any drive, though, doesn't it? That they're independent signals, which would probably uh, hint at you would be able to step and write data at the same time. Maybe um, I actually have kind of data sheets for two of the drives I own: a Mitsubishi mechanism and a TIAC mechanism, and they actually go into some detail about. Um, their expectations. Um, of course, expect you violate an expectation. It doesn't mean that your drive will block it. It'll. They're just trying to direct you down the right path. Uh, but some of the data sheets say explicitly say if you do this, uh, then then it won't work. Then it then it will get blocked. So uh, maybe worth me me rereading those. Uh, maybe before I send the slides out, I can add links to those drive data sheets into the links section because uh, they're they're pretty interesting reading. Give you a lot of detail. Some traffic on the chat about the Floppertron. It's three years ago now. <laughs> Time flies. What's it was, that was my uh, my, my comment about um, uh, that that video which uh, uh, Stuart has linked to. I said it was about nine months ago. It was actually August seventeen. Uh, so uh, <laughs> my memory is not very good uh, uh, of that, but. Uh, Yeah, I've just spotted Ian Smallshire's put uh, the Imperial March. That's the one I've uh, most commonly heard with the Flappertron.